Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Cafe Ole this week. My name is Jay Rosen. I'm a volunteer with Nefesh Benefesh. I myself made Aliyah with them just over 15 years ago. And here at Cafe Ole, we go over the everyday Hebrew that you need here in Israel for everyday life, but also to set you so set yourself up for success. Um, this may not be the Hebrew that you're learning in Ulpan currently or um, the, uh, the Hebrew that you learned in day school or yeshiva or in university or even in previous trips to Israel. But we really wanna focus on everyday Hebrew, practical Hebrew that you need, whether it's paying the bills, um, getting around town, finding out what's happening in town, reading the news, lodging a complaint, all the everyday things you're used to doing in your respective countries of origin and you should be able to do here in Israel, regardless of your level of Hebrew. We have a lot of people on the call each week. Most people are at an intro level, and so that's our focus. It's a little bit more frontal based here, also because we're online and on Zoom. It's just easier to go with it like that. Um, and as always, we try to make these as participant friendly as possible. So if you have questions about, um, in general about Hebrew, but specifically topics that you'd like us to go over, please write them to us, either email Nefesh Benefesh or um, write it in the chat window. Any questions you have about Hebrew in general, you wanna critique uh, the shirt I'm wearing or what I say today or a suggestion for a future class, please write them in the chat window. As I start the lesson shortly, if you have any questions about what we're going over specifically, please write that in the Q&A button. There's a lot of you and there's only one of me who's teaching and moderating at once. Thank you in advance for hearing that and doing that. Um, as I said, today we're going to do a um, request from you, the participants. All of our, um, we try to make this as uh, user-friendly as possible, like I said, because it needs to be relevant to what you want to do, not just what I'm interested in, although usually there's a nice overlap with that, um, as is today's class. Today's class is our penultimate class. I love that word in English. Penultimate meaning the, the second before last. Next week will be our last class before we break for the Chagim, for the holiday season, and then we'll reconvene, um, as we love to say in Hebrew, after the holidays, that nice ambiguous what is the after the holidays, but we'll be back in October. Um, next week will be our last class. Today is our penultimate. All of our previous classes, including this one in a few days time is up on youtube.com. Just go to the website, type in Nefesh Benefesh or Cafe Ole, and you'll find our um, uh, previous lessons. This lesson will be up in another one to two days up there. Um, so if you have people who aren't on Zoom or can't make the call or you have to leave early or you wanna review, right? It's not easy for you to take down um, notes by pen and paper or screenshots. You're always welcome to go back, review the lessons as we go through them. So as I said, this was a, um, a user request, a participant request that we had to do a um, politics-free politics class. Okay. Um, what I mean by that is we're not going to get into politics. We're not going to discuss politics in a partisan manner. We're going to talk about politics. What are the words that we use in the news, in the media, in everyday conversation to discuss what's happening on the local, national, international level, right? Um, we've done a very similar class with regards to the elections. And if you go back on YouTube, you'll be able to see that class. And so some of the words are going to be similar. Some of them are not. So again, we're not going into my personal politics, your personal politics, anyone else's today. We're talking about the words that you need to discuss politics, not any of the um, uh, demagoguery, none of the name calling we're gonna do today. That's not the point of this, is to talk about civics for lack of a better term, right? How do we do civics in Israel in Hebrew? We know how we do this in English in our respective countries of origin or perhaps in other languages, how do we do it in Hebrew, in Israel, now in the 21st century? So as always, I'm gonna share my screen. You are welcome to follow along, screenshot it, pen and paper, or however else you'd like to take notes. Again, this lesson will be up on YouTube in another one to two days. So if you can't follow along, by all means, you'll be able to watch it, pause it, whatever you'd like with YouTube. Okay, so let me open up the vocab list for today. So as always, um, the Hebrew is on the right-hand side with the dots and bars that indicate vowel sounds. In Hebrew, we call that nikud. Transliteration for an American English 
audience, but everyone can follow along the transliteration. The next one to the left, English on the left and the farthest left notes, but we're gonna go through all these words together. So we're gonna start off with some verbs. Verbs are always a good place to start when we talk about politics. Politics are, is an activity. Um, we get very heated about it and emotional about it. All the better to describe what we're doing, not just the things we're doing. So all of these verbs, all five of these verbs are in the infinitive form. The infinitive form is just the fancy word to say to do, to be, to act, right? It's that to followed by the action and it's infinitive because it's not conjugated for a specific place and time or person. Remember it is in Hebrew, you have to take in consideration tense, past, present and future and gender and how many people are talking and which and who's speaking or who's acting rather. So we're gonna go through five verbs that are typically used when we talk about politics in terms of how the government works, right? Not about how we talk about politics, which is often yelling and screaming and um, baiting people and so forth. No, we're talking about politics. So the first verb, very important. And again, there's a lot of overlap with elections here is livchol or livchor, depending on how you, you pronounce the letter resh. Okay, livchol means to choose. In everyday language, it means to choose. It also means to vote. Okay, it can mean both things. Everyday language, um, it means to choose. You're typically not voting on a regular basis, um, but you're choosing things. You're choosing what to wear, choosing what color to paint your apartment, whatever it may be. Um, and as I wrote here in the notes on the left-hand side, the preposition that is usually um, following livchol is b. B stands for betoch, which simply means in. It translates into Hebrew literally as to choose in, but just know that the um, preposition that's usually following the verb livchol in Hebrew is b. You're not going to necessarily translate it using b, but that's how it rolls in Hebrew. Next verb is a very similar verb. It's latzbiya. Latzbiya also means to vote. We have two verbs to vote in Hebrew. Bechirot is the word that we use for the catch-all elections. It's the verbal noun. It's the gerund that comes from the infinitive. Bechirot are choices, literally choices, but we translate into Hebrew as elections. Okay, latzbiya is the actual act of voting. Latzbiya also means to point a finger. Latzbiya shares the same root as etzba, which is a finger. Actually in Hebrew, each, five, each of your five digits has a specific name. It's actually pretty cool. We're not gonna go through that today, but just know that a finger is an etzba. So it's related to the word and it means also to point a finger. Ani matzbiya ala baya. I'm, I can put my finger or I can point my finger on the problem of the day. That's one way to use it, but we mostly use it for latzbiyas to vote, right? So when we ask people to go out and vote, it's lechu latzbiya, go out and vote when there's an election day. This is a very important um, verb when we're talking about after you vote. We've talked about this a lot. Once you vote, remember Israel is a parliamentary democracy. So a lot of the words we're going to go over are not just important to understand the words we use in Israel, but especially for my fellow Americans, is to understand this is a parliamentary democracy, not what we have in America. And so therefore, the system is quite different. Um, Israel also has its own unique system on top of being a parliamentary democracy. But one of the big things is lehalkiv. The verb lehalkiv can mean to construct. For example, if you go to Ikea, also known as Ikea, but in Israel we call it Ikea. And you decide um, when you, um, uh, after you buy all your things at the cash register, you purchase everything, you leave the store. And just before you leave the store, you have the option for Hovalot Veharkava. Hovalot is movers or shippers, and Harkava is assembly, right? We all know that Ikea. IKEA allows, um, you can have people come, workers from the store, come and assemble your furniture for you, or you can do it yourself. That's, you know, a lot of how they save their money. Lehalkiv is to install or to put something together. Okay, we use this verb lehalkiv when the, um, after the elections for the Knesset are done and the government 
that is um, the, uh, the head of the party or the person most likely to form a coalition government that's chosen by the president is tasked with lehalkiv mimshala to um, construct a government within a certain amount of days, right? Being a parliamentary democracy, the president assigns usually the head of a party that has the most likelihood of forming a stable coalition, stable government, um, and they're in the task of lehalkiv mimshala. Very important word. A quick refresher for everyone. Um, Israel uh, you, has always had a coalition government. Um, to have a government in Israel requires a majority in Knesset. Knesset is comprised of 120 seats, which has to do with Beta Knesset Tagadol, the um, great synagogue, the council of elders during the second temple period that's mentioned in the Talmud. We take that same number and we have a number of delegates in the Knesset. Out of them, they need to form at least a, a simple majority to have a government. Simple majority of 20 is divide the number by half and add one, so 61. Okay, very simple. There are a couple, I just used the word lehalkiv. Now we're going to do two verbs that are the complete opposite of lehalkiv. If lehalkiv is to the verb that we use to form a government, to form a coalition, we have verbs that are about how to, how to tear it apart. In a parliamentary democracy, you have the option of um, overthrowing, not, uh, it's probably the bad word, right? Dissolving government, dissolving parliament. In Israel, we have three different ways to do that, to bring down a government earlier than its normal four-year um, uh, span. One of them, and all of them can be used with the verb lehapil. Lehapil means to make something fall. Okay, it's related to the verb lipol. Lipol is simply to fall, right? Nafalti ala ritzpa, I fell on the floor. This is the causative form of that verb. So to cause something to fall is lehapil, right? If someone, for example, one of the ways you can dissolve Knesset is by um, bringing forward a vote of no confidence. And we're gonna get to that word in a minute. Um, and if that vote passes, then government, then Knesset is dissolved and new elections are called, in which case that vote was used to lehapil et to, to make the government fall. Okay, another way you can make um, the, Knesset, the government and the, the current um, sitting of the Knesset uh, dissolve is to use the verb to dissolve, lefazel. Now, it's important to know lefazel we don't use in, to dissolve as in some chemical reaction, right? I'm thinking back to first or second grade, learning all those different words, dissolve and solution and solvent and solute. That's not what we're talking about. Lefazel means to dissolve or to dissipate or to break up. It's not really the verb to break apart, but if that's a good action for you, um, use that. But lefazel, for example, a Rosh Mimshala, the prime minister, the head of the government, can decide to lefazer et a Mimshala. He, can he or she can decide to dissolve the Knesset and thus the government based on calculations that they'll do better in a snap election or whatever it may be, right? So that's two of the three ways that you can um, uh, dissolve Knesset and call for early elections. The third one is that the Knesset and specifically the government is tasked with um, uh, voting in a state budget. Budget in Hebrew is taktsiv. I did not include that in this list. You can look that word up on your own. Um, within a certain amount of time of being sworn in, right? This current government has until November to pass a state budget. If they don't do it within a certain amount of time, elections, early elections are automatically called. So three ways to do it, no confidence, which we're gonna get to in a second, the prime minister, him or herself, dissolving elections, le fazer, and the third, the state budget, um, taxiva medina, not being passed. Okay, let's get to some words when it comes to elections, because we talk about that way too much, certainly in the last two years. Um, an election campaign, there is, a fa there is a proper Hebrew word for it, but we simply use the word campaign. Okay, campaign, very simple to use. This next word is a very important word when we talk about elections in Israel, it's called gewalt. 
Those of you who speak Yiddish, you know this word. Those of you who don't speak Yiddish and you've heard the expression oi gewalt, you're already on the right track to understand gewalt. As I wrote here, gewalt, usually called a campaign gewalt, is a tactic in Israeli elections and Israeli politics to scare the voters into voting in a certain way. Um, and the pundits and the commentary and the all sorts of people always talk about when a campaign starts to do a campaign gewalt, when a party that's running for Knesset decides to do a campaign gewalt. It's usually towards the last few days, weeks of a electoral cycle. Um, and it's really meant to scare people. It's usually something shocking. It's brand new information or it's very salacious or it's very, um, very, it's very dramatic, usually in the way it's presented. Usually it's not the highest brow of stuff. Um, so it's a little trashy usually in content, but the point is it's used quite a lot. And then the commentary is about, well, why did that party use a gewalt? Why did they use it at this point? What are they trying to get out of it? Um, it's also a tactic that's used by politicians and parties throughout the, um, electoral cycle and, and they're in government, right? How do we do this to drum up support by scaring people or scaring fellow members of Knesset? Um, not a wonderful ethical way to do things, but unfortunately it has worked in the past quite a bit. And to go with that, when we're talking about elections, we actually use a very interesting word to describe um, political ads. In Israel, as opposed to other countries, it is very highly regulated how much time each party running for Knesset gets, and in addition, how much money they get um, from the government, hard money and soft money that they can use towards a political campaign. And a political campaign is usually comprised of ta'amula. Ta'amula is best translated as propaganda, but it's the word that we use for an electoral campaign. Right, if a campaign is everything about it, tamula are the ads on TV, on radio, on the internet. It's the actual stuff that um, we're consuming as citizens. It comes from the root ein mem lamed. We've talked about this many times and it's always important to remind you that in Hebrew, every word is created from a three letter shoresh. Shoresh is the word for root, as in it grows in the ground. Um, and each one, when used in a very specific way, and we've talked about this before, spelling is destiny in Hebrew. You cannot mess around with spelling in Hebrew. You can mess around with the word, the spelling of a word sometimes. There's a yud, da, da, but the, the order of the shoresh, in this case, ein mem lamed, cannot be changed because the moment you change it, it means something completely different. So it has to be ein mem lamed, no substitutions, no additions. You can add additions as part of the binyan, how we create a word out of those three letters. Okay, so the root here, ein mem lamed, is, um, comes from another verb that's similar to la'avod, to work, but this root, amal, is really laborious work. It's very heavy work, it's very toiling work. Um, when that word is used in Hebrew, amal is a very, um, a lot of labors, hard labor. Okay. Um, when we're talking about politics, this is obviously a very big one, is public opinion. Public opinion is best um, uh, obtained and scientifically obtained and scientifically understood through a sekel. Sekel, row 12, or seker, is a poll. Not a poll as in something holding up a, a tent, right? Or an Arctic or a South or North Pole. Pole as in you ask people a bunch of questions, get their feedback, then compare it with other, excuse me, uh, results. Okay, Sekel is usually very important for politicians, for a government to understand what, excuse me, what's going on in the field. This is also a very important point, excuse me, because in Israel, um, Israel is one of three uh, parliamentary democracies in the world that votes as one electoral district, meaning that we do not have direct representation on the local level, on the national level, right? So there, I live in Tel Aviv. There is no one representing Tel Aviv officially in Knesset that I have voted in directly. That goes for Yerushalayim, that goes for Kalmiel, Belsheva, doesn't matter. 
We don't have direct elections. So the best way to understand what the people are, the voters who brought us in and potentially can um, not vote us in the next time we have elections is a secel, is a poll. Because otherwise there is no, um, there is no uh, mechanism that a regular citizen has to be heard by the government or by any one of those 120 Knesset members. It's great when they do it, they're just not obliged to. They don't have to, according to the law. Okay, this is a very important word, mandat. Mandat does sound and is what it um, is the cognate, right? It is mandate. But we use this word in a lot of different ways. It's not just hamandata briti, the British mandate from before 1948. We use mandat in the every sense of the word mandate, right? Does a government have a mandat to do something? Does a, um, a prime minister have a mandat to do to pass this law or advance that law, right? We talk about this word a lot. What political right or political capital does a person in government have to do something? Mandat is the word we often use for that. Very important word, si'a. Okay, so we've already had elections. We already have new members of Knesset. Of those members of Knesset, we have um, a government, right? And within that government and within all of the Knesset, those people who are voted in through a party, and I didn't put the word here for a political party, which is miflaga, maflaga, you have a si'a. Once you're voted into Knesset, the political party you were um, running under to get voted in becomes a si'a, a faction, right? Or a party that sits within the government or in the opposition. But the point is, it's now called a si'a. We don't refer to it as a political party anymore. We call it a faction, si'a. It's a very important word. You hear this a lot. Um, each faction will have its own chair, man or woman, along with the government. The chair of that party, as well as the subcommittees, the um, uh, chair of the opposition, as well as the chair of the um, coalition, is in Hebrew, the, the official term is Yoshev Rosh, or Yoshevet Rosh for a woman. So for a man, Yoshev Rosh, for a woman, Yoshevet Rosh, we're already here at row 16. Um, Yoshevet Rosh, Yoshev means sitting, Rosh, head, Rosh Hashanah, head. So the sitting head, just like we would say oftentimes in English, right? The sitting head of something is the person who's the head of it. In English, we like to use the word chair, we now use chair instead of chairman or chairwoman. Chair is nice gender inclusive. In Hebrew, we talked about this the other week with abbreviations and um, acronyms, right? Row 16, here's another one. Yol or Yorit, right? We take the first two letters of the first word and the, se the first letter of the second word and we create an acronym for the chair of a, a faction, a committee, a um, opposition, a coalition, whatever it may be, yol or your, or yorit, yorit for a woman, yol for a man, yorit for a woman. Okay, very easier, much easier to say yol or yorit instead of yoshev rosh or yoshevet rosh, right? Two at most syllables at most four syllables, um, non-abbreviated. So you'll, or you'll, read, you'll see a lot of that in the news when you start reading the news in Hebrew. Um, someone will be referred to as a yol or yorit. It's a chair, not just in government, by the way, it's a chair of anything. It could be a chair of a board of directors. It could be a chair of a committee. It could be the chair of anything. I mentioned this word before, no confidence, e imun. Imun is confidence. When we're talking about in terms of trust or more importantly, faith in Hebrew, e, just like when we say e if shell, right? If f shell is possible, e if shell is impossible. E at the beginning of a word usually indicates a negative thing, right? In this case, no confidence. Um, uh, e of shell, impossible. So that im or non or not in Hebrew we use e, i e aleph yud, and usually with a dash makaf. Okay. Um, next two words again, 
there are Hebrew words for this. The Academy for the Hebrew Language has created words. They just haven't cut on. Instead, we use very um, generic universal jargon, coalitia opposizia. Okay, coalitia is the coalition. That is the government, right? Because the government needs to have if it wants to survive a simple majority, at least a simple majority of 120 seats, there are governments that do not, and they are what's called a minority government. Um, they're usually very unstable and it usually leads to early elections. So a coalition typically needs to be more than that. And a coalition, by the way, can also include people not in the government. Let's say it's for passing a bill or anything like that and you need bipartisan support or multi-partisan support you'll still use the word coalitia. But usually when we use the word coalitia, we're talking about the coalition government. And that's in opposition to the opposition, oppositio. Right? If you're not in the coalitia, you're in the oppositia. Um, currently, the oppositia, the yor of the oppositia, yora oppositia, is the former prime minister. Very important to know that it, the opposition doesn't necessarily have to work together. Great example is this current Knesset, right? The current, um, co the current opposition, not the coalition, the current opposition is comprised of several right-wing parties and the um, joint list of Arab parties. Not exactly ideologically and practically the, the closest of partners, right? So just because you're not in the coalition doesn't mean you have to act like a coalition. An opposition is simply sitting in opposition to the coalition. They don't have to form their own government unity, anything. They sit in opposition and their role is to oppose everything the, go the government does. Very important when you're trying to follow along what's happening with a bill. Um, those of you who are of a certain age, you remember from America, Schoolhouse Rock and um, how a bill gets made. And in America, it's a very certain way. In other countries, they have their own way. Israel has a very similar way to other parliamentary democracies, even like in America. Um, when a bill is put forward the very first time, it's called a kriya tromit or kriya tromit. Kriya comes from the verb likro, likro, which means to read. It also means to call. And tromit comes from the same root, the same shorash as terem. We've talked about this word many times. Terem is also the um, first aid clinic around the country. Um, Kriya tromit translates as best to the preliminary reading, right? If a bill wants to get passed, the way it works in Israel is as follows. You bring it to a Mliata Knesset, a Knesset plenary session, where the Knesset is called to, um, called to order. Um, ideally, all 120 members of Knesset will be in attendance. Most of the time, that's not the case. Um, and a bill is um, brought forward for vote for Kriya uh, Tromit, for a first preliminary reading, right? And if it passes, it then goes to our next one, 21, a Vada. Okay, in a Vada, just like in other, par in other democracies around the world, um, the Knesset has many subcommittees, right? And these committees both create laws to be passed to, to um, offer up bills, um, to weigh in on bills, to weigh in on the situation of things. Israel has multiple committees. The word is va'ada. One committee is a va'ada, multiple committees va'adot. After a bill, let's say a bill is um, created in a va'ada, it's brought to the Mliata uh, Knesset, it's brought to the Knesset plenary for a kriya tromit. Okay, it's brought in for that preliminary vote. Let's say it passes. It's then brought back to the committee or any other committee that wants to look at it and perhaps add to it, subtract from it, and so forth. And then it's brought back to the mlia. It's brought back to the plenary for a kriya shnia vishlishit. Right? If the preliminary reading is kriya tromit, the shnia shlishit are, as it probably sounds, the second and third readings of the bill. A bill in order to be passed in Knesset needs three readings. And typically that's the way it goes. It's born in committee, comes out for a kriyat romit, then goes back to committee and then gets voted on usually simultaneously, right? It'll be voted on the Knesset floor a second call. And then the um, 
Speaker of the Knesset, also a Yol, um, Yol or Knesset, will um, ask for a further um, reading of that Knesset, meaning a further vote on it. If on the third one, it passes by a majority, it becomes law. Okay, that's how a bill gets made and passed in Israel. Um, and it starts with the Vada and the Kriyat Rumit. So two very important things. The Vada, we have, like I said, multiple Vadot happening all at once. Some are ongoing um, committees. Some are created specifically by the reigning government. Um, and so each of them have certain powers invested to them and they're made up of both coalition and opposition members. Okay, let's talk about governance because governance is a really important thing. Again, Israel works different than other countries in terms of how it's uh, split up and how it's administered on multiple levels. So we, we've been talking now a lot about the national level, which is represented by the Knesset and the government. Let's go a few steps down. The next biggest unit in Israel is what we call an iria. Iria is a term that means both a city hall, the actual building of a city hall, but also a municipality, right? This has to, this deals with the largest um, local representation in Israel, which is an ir or ir, which is a city. Um, all of these designations are based on um, the population size of a given area. Right, so for a town to become a city, it needs to have a certain amount of people living in it. I think it's currently 150,000. Please don't take my word on it. You can look at that up on Wikipedia yourself. Um, but I think it's around 150,000. Anything 150,000 above is already an eel with an ilia. Okay, the ilia is in charge of local administration within a city. Right, so here in Tel Aviv, we have Iriat Tel Aviv. Jerusalem, Iriat, Yerushalayim. Netanya, Iriat, Netanya. Any city has a Iria that goes with it. The Iria is comprised of Rosh Ha'ir, often called Rosh Ha'iria. So again, Rosh, head, Ir, city, or Iria, municipality or city hall. And that person is, in Hebrew, we call the Rosh Ir or the Rosh Iria. That's the mayor, right? The same term we use for mayor. In Hebrew, we say it literally, the head of the municipality. Okay, um, that, and then a municipality will also have a moatza. A moatza ta'ir, moatza is a council. Okay, we're gonna get to that word quite a bit in the next, um, in the next two smaller forms of um, uh, representation here in Israel. But moatza gets us to our next word, which is moatza mekomit. Moatza is a council. Um, the official Hebrew word uh, for the USSR, right, which is the United Soviet Socialist Republics or something along those lines, is Brit Hamuatzot, Brit Covenant or Union, just like we use for the United States, Aratzot Brit, but um, the USSR is Brit Hamuatzot, the Union of Muatzot, a Muatza Soviet. Right, it's a council. That was the model of um, the USSR of these local councils that ruled everything. Other countries have also local councils. It's just a nice um, connection with those words because Moatza is not something you'll know normally hear, um, except when you talk about local jurisdiction here in Israel. Moatza Mekomit is the next, um, is under an Iria. If Iria is the largest local administrative body, Moatza Mekomit is the next one. So to think about towns, villages, um, anything that's below 150,000, if that's what the hallmark is, but it's not the smallest, it's in the middle. So these are small towns. Think, um, a, I'm trying to think of a small town nearby. A, I'm not gonna rack my head over that. I live in Tel Aviv, it's enough. Um, Moatza Mekumit is a small town. Usually it will also have a mayor or the head of the Moatza Mekumit. It won't be called a mayor because it's not a city, as well as a town council. Okay, so a small town is a Moatza Mekumit. And then the smallest is a Moatza Ezorit. Okay, if Mekumit, Moatza Mekumit is a local council, Mekumi means local. 
Moetza Ezorit is a regional council. Ezor means region, Ezor also. Excuse me. And this is the smallest form. This is a um, usually a combination of small, very small towns or villages, usually kibbutzim and moshavim that are in a given area. And their population is so small that they're governed together by a local, by a regional council, right? So parts of the Arava have a Moetza Ezorit. Parts of the Negev have that. Parts up north have a Moetza Ezorit because there aren't enough people inhabiting those towns to have their own local council. Okay, so they just bound together and combine resources to do to um, perform local governance. So a Moetza Ezorit is the absolute smallest form of local governance you have in Israel. Next highest is Moetza Mekomit, row 24. And then the largest is in Iria, a municipality. Okay. In addition to that, we have something in Israel called a Mechoz. Mechoz is a district. In, Hebrew, in Israel, we have um, a number of different kinds of Mechozot. Mechozot is the plural of Mechoz, but it's a masculine word, as you see the M here on the left-hand side. It though um, it becomes a plural as Mechozot. Um, in the judicial system in Israel, we have six mechozot, right? So when you go to a um, court, just like you do in other countries, you start at the local court and you move up all the way um, in appeals if you get as high as the Supreme Court, right? But you have district courts. The country is split up into six mechozot, um, and these have to do with district courts, um, people who are looking to um, reform the way governance works in Israel talk a lot about these mechozot as being um, existing districts from which people can choose the representatives for a national level. It's one of the many different um, theories and ideas that are put forth of how we can reform um, the Knesset and um, the national government by having direct representation. The mechoz is one of them. Also, the police have their own um, mechozot, right? Police districts in how they um, uh, chop up the country in terms of their own um, policing and in terms of um, supervising what's going on in the country have their own mechozot. Um, mechoz is, just becomes a very important word to understand local governance. Okay, and then the last word that's really important is the word for civic, is the word for state, but not state as in the state of Israel, right? This is not Medinat Israel, this is state as an adjective. And the word is mamlachti. I use these words civic and state because there is no real direct um, translation from the Hebrew into English. Mamlachti comes from the same root as mamlacha, kingdom, melech, king, Malka, queen, of course. But the idea is that this is sovereign, um, but it's a state um, issue. Um, it's often said that the Nasi Hamedina, the president of the state, needs to be Mamlachti or Mamlachtit when it's a woman, right? Mamlachti, that they need to be civic. I'm not talking about civil, but civic, meaning that they are for everyone and state. They're a state office for the state, for the state's inhabitants. Um, mamlachti is the word that we use for the public school system in Israel. Whether your child goes to a mamlachti uh, chiloni or a mamlachti dati school, we have two, um, we have a couple different forms of schooling in Israel. The two biggest, um, not the two biggest, but two of the most well known in the public system are the secular and the religious, right? Mamlachti chiloni, mamlachti dati. We use mamlachti before both of them to indicate its state, right? It's not private. It's not, we don't use the word public in the same way like we say public school in America. I know that public school in the UK and in other countries means the complete opposite. Mamlachti in this case means state, meaning it is um, sovereign. It's, it's for the entire state and all of its citizens. Um, so mamlachti is also an adjective, like I said, the president is meant to be mamlachti. We should um, all aspire ourselves and our representatives to be mamlachti in how they um, act, right? They're not thinking about just themselves or the political party they may represent, but rather mamlachti in the larger sense of things. 
I'm going to stop here because I see we have a bunch of questions. Um, like I said, we've covered some of these words before. There's a lot more, obviously, to unpack when it comes to politics. Um, but it's also important for you as Olim Chadashim, as new citizens of Israel, to understand how the, the system works here and also how it doesn't work. OK, Q&A. Let's start there. Um, Ted asks, what an in-person rally can be considered tamula? Great question, Ted. Um, no, usually we won't call a tamula. Tamula, that word we had before, let me pull that up here. Tamula is the actual ad. It's the jingle, it's the TV ad, it's the radio ad, it's the internet ads that are all over the place during an election day period, election campaign. It's not an in-person thing. Usually that will be called a, um, uh, we'll use all the regular words for a performance or a um, demonstration or a um, get together. So we'll often use the word erua, event, erua, um, hafgana, a demonstration, mofa, um, which is any kind of performance. Um, we won't usually call that tamulai in, its propaganda sense, although it very much is because it's a campaigning event. It's a highly partisan event. Great question. Um, anonymous, how do you say install an officer and a candidate? Um, we don't have the idea of an installation of, we have installation of a government. The Halkiv Memshala, excuse me, is to assemble a government together. And then when a government is formed, um, they are sworn in. Just like all 120 members of Knesset are sworn in, there's a ceremony in which they come up. Um, when it's, excuse me, when it's all 120 members of um, the government, they usually are sworn in at their seats. When it's a government and those government um, ministers to be sworn in will do their own one by one up on the dais at uh, the Knesset, um, but that's the word we use. And we use the word to swear in, which is lashbia, um, ani uh, nishba, I swear, and it's usually using the verb li I am um, com I'm committing myself to something. I'm obliging myself, um, but to install a candidate, we don't, um, we don't typically use that kind of, um, description when talking about politics. Is the committee word used anytime like a PTA committee or only Knesset? Great question, Mrs. Shane. Um, Vada is any kind of committee, like I said, any kind of committee. It can be a government committee, it can be a PTA, it could be your um, synagogue's uh, committee for something. It could be any kind of committee is a Vada. Simple use for all that. Um, Lila asks a question I knew was going to be asked. Why is the why isn't the plural mechoz mechozim? It's mechozot. It's a grammatical reason, and it's mechozot. Um, to get into it is very complicated. Uh, the best way I can describe it to you, the answer is say mechozot and mechozim. When you say mechozot your mouth does not have to stretch as much because your, your mouth is already used, being um, constrained because of the consonants. So mechozot, your mouth is already in a position to go in, um, make o sounds. Mechozim, that z, the o, z, i, m trans, um, transition is not only harder to make, but it also in, introduces other sounds, right? When you hear me say mechozim, there's this e sound that's not Hebrew, right? We don't have a diphthong there. It's an im. So instead, we say mechozot. That's a very simplistic way to um, understand that, but mechoz is mechozot. Okay. Um, anonymous. Um, what's the difference between a vaad, vaad and a vada? Okay, a committee is a vada. Vad is usually um, a similar thing. It's usually a council. It's usually um, a word that you hear more in religious circles. Vada is usually a much more um, uh, mamlachti word. We use that word mamlachti, right? Vada can be a committee for anything. A vad is usually some sort of small council. Um, vada is usually a committee. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, synonymous said uh, mamlakhti is a statesman. That's a great way to put it, right? Because I put state as an adjective. Great. Um, uh, that. Dov Ber Poliski asked a political issue such as security or poverty relief. How to say that? So an issue is no se. No se is a topic or an issue, right? So no se. Um, you can look those up. There aren't any that require further explanation. And like I've said many times, I'm not a human dictionary. So the words for security or poverty, you can look those words up. Um, but the issue, the word that we use usually is the topic of security or the topic of something. The other word we'll often use, and it sounds more politicized, is the word mashbel or mashber, which means crisis. Okay, but any sort of issue, no se. Um, John, why do we use VAD for a residence committee, not VADA? Great point. Like I said, think VAD as a smaller thing. If VADA is a committee, you usually don't have a committee for your apartment. You have your VAD bite, right? You have the people who live in the building. It's a smaller unit. If that's the best way for you all to think about it, a VAD is usually small. VADA is usually big in terms of the amount of people who are there and the mandat, the mandate that they have to do certain things. I see multiple people ask that question. So Barry asked that, Lila asked that. Um, by all means, thank you for asking those questions. And can you recommend reading sources on the political system? I absolutely can. Um, and I use this as a recommendation all the time, folks, which is Wikipedia. Wikipedia, when it comes to Israel, are some of the most fought after, edited, but meticulously cited places to look. If you look up the political system of Israel on Wikipedia, it is great. And if you don't trust Wikipedia, you can look at the sources that are cited at the end of it in the footnotes. Tremendous articles there in English and Hebrew and other languages. Highly recommend Wikipedia to read about the political system in Israel, in English, obviously. Okay. Any last questions about this specific um, topic? I see we have a bunch of questions in the q and um, I'm going to just quickly skim through them just to make sure that there isn't anything um, there that has to do with this one, even though I said quite distinctly, um, please only write um, about this lesson in the Q&A and not in the chat. And some of you um, adhered to my request. Thank you for that. Any last questions about anything else in with regards to Hebrew? Um, we have a few minutes left in the Q&A if you have any questions. Great. So with that, thank you all so much. As I said, next week is our last session. And then after that, we will break for the Chagim. Um, for the holiday season. So next week, our last um, lesson, um, the 30th of August, same time, same place. I will see you here. Uh, until then, this lesson will go up on Nefesh Benefesh's YouTube channel in the next day or so. If you have any requests for further topics for us to cover, please write to Nefesh Benefesh directly. And until then, thank you all so much. And see you all very soon. Take care.